This is a Reconstructionist Radio production. Please visit GaryNorth.com forward slash free books to download this book as a PDF. Through New Eyes Developing a Biblical View of the World James B. Jordan Copyright 1988 Published by Wolgamuth and Hyatt Brentwood, Tennessee 14. The World of the Patriarchs We have stated that there is always a decline that partially explains the need for a new covenant. It is also true, however, that even if man had not sinned, there would have been advances from glory to glory. Thus, the coming of a new covenant is not wholly to be explained by the failure of the previous one. Also, involved is a fact of human maturation, so that what was once appropriate and fitting at a certain stage of childhood now must be superseded. As children grow, we have to keep getting them new shoes and new clothing, partially because the old ones are wearing out, but also because the child has outgrown them. This explains why God never simply calls his people back to the previous covenant. The prophets come and tell the people that they have broken the covenant and remind them of their duties in the terms of the old covenant. But when covenant renewal comes, it is never simply a return to the old ways. Rather, it is a renewal of the old ways in a new form a form appropriate to the times and to the stage of growth. As we move into the period of the patriarchs, it will be helpful to set out a rough overview of covenantal history. After the flood, God recreated the world with the Noahic covenant. With the sins of Ham and then Nimrod, the world order was threatened, and God took advantage of the opportunity to set aside a new, Edenic land with the Abrahamic covenant, designating one nation, the Hebrews, to be priests to the rest. That nation of priests fell into sin in Egypt, and God took the opportunity to recreate the garden, sanctuary, with the Mosaic Covenant, setting aside the Levites and Aaronic priests to guide the Israelite nation. Next, just as God planted a garden in Eden and then made a man to rule it, so also after the priests of Israel fell into sin, 1 Samuel 1-3, through God took the opportunity to recreate the Edemic king with the Davidic Covenant. With the collapse of the Davidic covenant and the exile, God took the opportunity to inaugurate the imperial stage of history and place Israel under the protection of world emperors. With the collapse of the imperial stage of history, seen in Rome's crucifixion of the Son of God, God enthroned Jesus Christ to be the true Noahic Gentile, the true Abrahamic Hebrew, the true Mosaic Aaronic priest, the true Davidic king, and the true world emperor. Each of these covenants is built on the previous one, by way of being added to it. Each one, however, transforms the previous one as well. Once Abram's family had been set aside as priests, it was no longer enough for the Gentiles to obey the Noahic covenant. They were also required to bless Abram. Once the tabernacle was set up, it was no longer proper for the Hebrews to have altars in many places. The only altar permitted was at the tabernacle. Once the tabernacle was set up, there was no more moving around of the tabernacle from place to place. Once the imperial stage of history was inaugurated, God's people were required to render to Caesar. Of course, with the coming of the new covenant, there were radical transformations of the entire old covenant series. With this as background and context, let us look at the age of the patriarch. We have already noticed God's laying hold on the situation in his call of Abram out of Ur of the Chaldees. We find that in Ur, Terah had sons, but his son Haran died. Genesis 11, verse 27 through 28. We find that in Ur, Abram took a wife, but his wife was barren. Genesis 11, verse 29 through 30. The message was clear. If you have sons in Babylon, they will die. And if you take wives in Babylon, they will be barren. And Exodus is clearly needed. Exodus. What follows is the second Exodus in the Bible the first being the flood. The exodus is the second step in the typological pattern of history, the transition from the old world to the new. It is the act of breaking down and restructuring as when I remove a glass from the cabinet and water from the pipe and put them together in a new thing, the glass of water. Or as when Jesus, having taken hold of bread, broke it and gave it a new name, his body. What is seen very simply and basically in such acts of restructuring is seen at large in the Exodus pattern. The following are some of the most important Exoduses in the Bible. 1. Noah's removal from captivity in the old world to the new. 2. 
Abram's removal from death in Babylon to life in Canaan, Genesis 11, verse 27 through 12, verse 5. 3. Abram's deliverance from captivity into Egypt to life in Canaan, Genesis 12, verse 6 through 13, verse 18. 4. Lot's deliverance from Sodom, Genesis 19, verse 1 through 16. God's offer of life at the mountain, 19, verse 17 through 19, and Lot's death in the wilderness, 19, verse 30 through 38. 5. Abraham's deliverance from danger and Philistia, Genesis 20. 6. Isaac's deliverance from danger and Philistia, Genesis 26. 7. Jacob's deliverance from enslavement in Mesopotamia, Genesis 31. 8. Israel's deliverance from enslavement in Egypt, Exodus 1 through 15. 9. The Ark of God, taken captive by Philistines, defeats their gods and is returned laden with spoils. 1 Samuel 5-6 through 6. 10. David's sojourn in the wilderness and Philistia, and then his return to the land. 1 Samuel 21 through 2 Samuel 2 11. Israel's return from Mesopotamia after the exile. 12. Jesus' exodus at Jerusalem, Luke 9, verse 31. His renunciation of Jerusalem and the temple, and his crucifixion outside the walls, the new kingdom of the Mount of Olives. 13. The removal of the church from Jerusalem before her destruction in 70 AD. Matthew 24, verse 16 through 18, Acts 1 through 28. When we remember that the Bible regards the Philistines as a subgroup of the Egyptians, Genesis 10, verse 13 through 14, we see that there are basically two avenues of Exodus in the Old Testament. Those from the north, Babylon, Mesopotamia, and those from the south, Egypt, Philistia. All of these find their fulfillment in Christ's abandonment of Jerusalem, and thus of the whole old world. The sequence of events in the Exodus is this. 1. Some threat, some aspect of sin, or of the curse, drives God's people from their home. Adam was driven from paradise. Famines drove Abram to Egypt, Genesis 12, verse 10. Isaac to Philistia, Genesis 26, verse 1, the Hebrews to Egypt, Genesis 43, verse 1, the disaster at Sodom drove Abraham to Philistia, Genesis 19, verse 28, Genesis 20, wicked oppressors drove Jacob to Mesopotamia, and David to Philistia. Personal sin put Lot in Sodom, Genesis 13, verse 7 through 13, conquest removed the ark to Philistia, 1 Samuel 4, and Israel to Babylon. 2 Kings 24 through 25. Love for his people caused our Lord to leave heaven to save us. 2. During the sojourn in captivity, Eve is assaulted by the serpent who wishes to use her to raise up his own wicked seed. There was intermarriage before the flood, Genesis 6 verse 2. Pharaoh and Abimelech attacked Sarah, Genesis 12 verse 13, 20 verse 2. Lot's daughters were corrupted, Genesis 19 verse 30 through 38. Abimelech's people threatened Rebekah. Genesis 26, verse 10. Laban disinherited Rachel and Leah. Genesis 31, verse 14 through 16. Pharaoh killed the boy babies and kept the girls for his people. Exodus 1, verse 15 through 22. Amalek attacked David's wives in the wilderness. 1 Samuel 30, verse 5. Esther was taken by Ahasuerus during the exile. Esther 2. Demons ravaged Israel during the ministry of our Lord. The Bride of Christ was assaulted continually by the Jews in the book of Acts. 3. The righteous used holy deception to trick the serpent and protect Eve. The serpent had deceived Eve in the beginning, 1 Timothy 2, verse 14. An eye for eye, tooth for tooth, it becomes the woman's trick to deceive the serpent. Thus, Abram called Sarah his sister on two occasions, and Isaac called Rebekah his sister, because they knew that an honest ruler would not simply seize their women without negotiating with them. Of course, the tyrant sees them anyways. Jacob tricked Laban to recover his wife's dowries. Genesis 30, verse 37 through 43. The Hebrew midwives lied to Pharaoh and saved Israelites' boys, and were blessed by God for doing so. Exodus 1, verse 18 through 21. David feigned madness in Philistia and pretended to serve the Philistines. 1 Samuel 21, verse 13. 1 Samuel 27 and 29 while actually defending Israel. Jesus protected and saved his holy bride by drawing Satan's fire to himself. 4. Very often, God's people are enslaved during the sojourn outside the land. Jacob was virtually enslaved by Laban, 
and Laban regarded him as a slave. Israel was enslaved in Egypt. Israel was virtually enslaved at the beginning of the Babylonian captivity. Jesus was dragged before Pilate and cast into prison. 5. God brings blessings upon his people during the captivity, but plagues the tyrant, either progressively or as a part of the deliverance. Abram acquired wealth in Egypt, Genesis 12, verse 16, but Pharaoh's house received plagues, Genesis 12, verse 17. Despite persecution, Isaac became wealthy in Philistia, Genesis 26, verse 12 through 17. God made Jacob wealthy in Mesopotamia, but gradually decapitalized Laban. Israel multiplied in Egypt, but Egypt was plagued. The ark brought plagues on the Philistines during its captivity, for Samuel 5, verse 6 through 6, verse 1. David gathered an army and wealth while in exile, but Saul was plagued by demons. 1 Samuel 16, verse 14, 22, verse 2, 1 Samuel 25. The Jews prospered in Babylon, and important Jews were found at court, while Nebuchadnezzar was driven insane. Daniel 4. The work of Christ on the cross redeemed the world, ensured our blessing, and destroyed Satan, while apostate Israel was plagued by demons during Christ's ministry throughout the book of Acts. 6. God miraculously intervenes, often with visions of the pagan Lord, in order to save his people. Noah's ark and flood were miracles, as we have seen. God's glory appeared to Abram in Ur, Acts 7, verse 2. God appeared to Abimelech to deliver Sarah, Genesis 20, verse 6 through 7. Angels came to save Lot and work miracles, Genesis 19, verse 11. God appeared to Laban and ordered him to leave Jacob alone, Genesis 31, verse 24. The miracle of the Passover saved Israel from Egypt, Exodus 12. The plagues of Philistia were miraculous. God appeared to Nebuchadnezzar and converted him, causing him to favor God's people more than before, Daniel 4. God sent Pilate's wife a vision, Matthew 27, verse 19. God raised Jesus from the dead. 7. Very often the serpent tries to shift blame and accuses the righteous man of being the cause of his difficulty. Thus, Pharaoh blamed Abram. Abimelech blamed Abraham, Abimelech blamed Isaac, Laban blamed Jacob, Pharaoh blamed Moses, and Saul blamed David. Herod and Pilate tried to shift the blame to each other. Pilate washed his hands and then put a sign on the cross blaming God and the believers. The Jews blamed the Christians. 8. God humiliates the false gods of the enemy. By invocation, the false gods of Egypt and Philistia were humiliated when Abraham and Isaac were delivered. Rachel sat on Laban's gods, Genesis 31, verse 34, and Jacob buried them, Genesis 35, verse 4. God judged all the gods of Egypt, Exodus 12, verse 12. The ark humbled Dagon of the Philistines, 1 Samuel 5, verse 3, and then destroyed him, verse 4. Nebuchadnezzar and Darius were converted and renounced their false gods, Daniel 4, 6, verse 7, 26 through 27. Christ defeated Satan, and the ascended Christ destroyed the temple, which had become an idolatrous abomination. 9. God's people depart with spoils. Noah brought the true wisdom of the old world with him. Genesis 8, verse 20 through 22. Abram left Egypt with spoils. Genesis 12, verse 16. Lot, of course, barely got out of Sodom alive, but Abraham received large gifts from Abimelech. Genesis 20, verse 16. Jacob had nothing when he went to Mesopotamia, but came back extremely rich. Genesis 32 through 33. Israel spoiled the Egyptians. Exodus 12, verse 35 through 36. The Philistines sent the ark back laden with gold. 1 Samuel 6, verse 17 through 18. David inherited Saul's kingdom. The Jews came back from Babylon with so much spoil. Zechariah 6, verse 10 through 11. Between 30 and 70 AD, the church spoiled the old covenant. She now spoils the world, bringing all into the kingdom. 10. Finally, God's people are installed in the Holy Land. This is, of course, the goal of the Exodus. Sometimes the people are brought out of bondage but reject the kingdom, as in the cases of Lot and of Israel in the wilderness. Eventually, though, they come into the New World. 11. Installation in the New Land means setting up worship, building God's house out of some of the spoils, and setting up a priesthood. This victory house-building pattern is actually what we are calling the establishment phase that comes after the Exodus. But for completeness, let us take note of it here. Noah built an altar and offered sacrifice. Genesis 8, verse 20. When Abram came out of Ur, he built altars in the land. Genesis 12, verse 7 through 8. 
When Abram came out of Egypt, he restored the altar at Bethel. Genesis 13, verse 4. When Abram was delivered from Abimelech, God opened Sarah's womb and gave him a son. Genesis 21, verse 1. Remember, the altar, the temple, etc. are all symbols for God's people. Thus, the miraculous birth of a messianic son corresponds to the building of a house for God. This is counterfeited with the birth of Lot's sons after his deliverance from Sodom. Genesis 19, verse 30-38. through 38. When Isaac was delivered from Philistia, he built an altar. Genesis 26, verse 25. When Jacob arrived back in Canaan after his captivity in Mesopotamia, he built an altar. Genesis 33, verse 20. When Israel escaped from Egypt, she built first a golden calf out of spoil, and then the tabernacle. Exodus 25, verse 1 through 9, 32, verse 2 through 4. The return of the ark from Philistine captivity eventually led to the building of the temple. The booty from David's Philistine wars also went to the temple. After David's exodus and enthronement, 1 Chronicles 22, verse 14 through 16, the temple was rebuilt after the return of Israel from Babylonian exile, Ezra, Haggai, Zechariah. After Jesus' exodus on the cross and his priestly installation in heaven, the true temple of the people of God began to be built of living stones. Such is the exodus pattern as we find it in the Bible. It is interesting to note a couple of other instances of the pattern. There is a counterfeit exodus in Judges 17 through 18. There we read of the erection of a counterfeit tabernacle and the ordaining of a counterfeit priest. Subsequently, we have a counterfeit journey by apostate Danites who had rejected the land God gave them. This issue is in a counterfeit conquest and the full establishment of a counterfeit sanctuary in Dan. Another interesting exodus is that of Jeroboam. Like Abraham, Jeroboam was promised part of Canaan. 1 Kings 11, verse 29 through 37. Solomon drove him into Egypt. When Solomon died, his son Rehoboam acted foolishly. Jeroboam returned to the land, and northern Israel made him their king. Jeroboam proceeded to apostatize and built counterfeit sanctuaries and set up counterfeit priests. Establishment Now that Abram has made his exodus from Babylon and come into the land, What is the nature of the covenant established with them, and with the succeeding patriarchs Isaac, Jacob, and the sons of Israel? First, the name of God given in connection with the new covenant is, as we have mentioned, God Almighty. By this name, God assured the patriarchs that he was fully capable of performing what he promised. Second, God gave new names to his restructured people. God changed Abram to Abraham and Jacob to Israel. Jacob means supplanter and pointed to as being the younger son who replaces the older. The older son is often a type of Adam, and the younger of the second Adam. Thus, Seth replaced Cain, Shemer plus Japheth, Genesis 5, verse 32, 9, verse 24, 11, verse 10. Isaac replaced Ishmael, Jacob replaced Esau, Joseph replaced older brothers, Ephraim replaced Manasseh, Genesis 48, verse 18, Eleazar and Ithamar replaced Nadab and Abihu, Exodus 6, verse 23, 24, verse 1, Leviticus 10, verse 1 through 6. David replaced his older brothers, and Jesus replaced Adam. Israel, however, means God's prince. When we get to Exodus and the Mosaic Covenant, we find that the priestly nation is called children of Israel, a race of princes and princesses. During the patriarchal period, however, they were known as Hebrews, Descendants of the Shemite Eber, Genesis 11, verse 16, 14, verse 13, 43, verse 32, Exodus 1, verse 15, 2, verse 6, 3, verse 18, 5, verse 3, 21, verse 2. The grant made to Abram and his descendants was the land of Canaan, Genesis 15, verse 18 through 21. The stipulations that came along with this grant were to obey all of God's laws, and in the area of sacraments, circumcision. The New World policy that came into being meant that the Hebrews were a nation of priests to evangelize and guide the Gentiles. This is what it meant for Abraham to be a father to other nations. The evangelistic ministry of the patriarchs is symbolized by their altars and wells, as we shall see. The internal policy of the people of Abraham was a simple patriarchal or clan order. The family head was also the spiritual leader. Since they were not yet a nation and did not govern any territory, they did not exercise the sort of civil authority. Thus, separation of church and state was not an issue during the patriarchal period. The Hebrews were a family and a church, but not a state. 
symbolism. Six symbols stand out as especially relevant to the Abrahamic covenant and to the patriarchal era. These symbols picture the nature of God's people and of their ministry. The symbols that come to play prominently in the patriarchal era are stars, dust, altars, pillars, trees, and wells. These symbols will recur in the Mosaic Covenant, where they will be organized into a package, the tabernacle. During the patriarchal era, however, the symbols were distributed under the open sky. God told Abram, I will make your descendants as the dust of the earth, so that if anyone can number the dust of the earth, then your descendants can also be numbered. God also told Abram that his seed would be like the stars of the heavens in quality and quantity. Thus, the people of Abraham would be a new heavens and a new earth. The promise to Abraham was that a righteous people would fill the earth as the dust, and that a righteous people would rule the earth as the stars. The kingdom of God, the spiritual people of Abraham, would someday cover the earth and rule it. Abraham was to conduct a ministry of evangelism and guidance among all the nations of the world. In this way, he would be a father of many nations. They would be his spiritual children. Paul picks this theme up and expands on it in Romans 4, but it is found in Genesis. Abraham began his evangelistic ministry in Haran before he got to Canaan, and we read that many converts came with him on his exodus. Genesis 12, verse 5. He conducted his ministry by erecting altars, which were, as we have seen, models of the holy mountain, ladders to heaven. At these altar sites, Abraham and his descendants led their converts in worship and taught them the ways of God. Abraham pitched his altars in connection with special trees, also ladders to heaven, as we have seen in chapter 7. The association of trees with altars, holy mountains, reminds us of the Garden of Eden. Edenic imagery is reinforced by the attention given to wells of water in connection with the patriarchal ministry. This is no accident. Abraham's evangelistic ministry was a call to people to make a spiritual pilgrimage back to God. In Adam's garden, there was a holy mountain a grove of trees, Genesis 23, verse 17, a well of water, and also a woman. Significantly, it is in connection with wells that the patriarchs found their wives. Rebecca and Rachel were both found at wells, Genesis 24, verse 11 through 45, 29, verse 2 through 10, and Moses found Zipporah at a well, Exodus 2, verse 15. Jesus presented himself as a true groom to a Samaritan divorcee and adulteress at a well, John 4, verse 6 through 26. The altar spoke of the coming sacrifice of Jesus Christ on God's holy mountain. The tree spoke of God's glory and shade, ladders to heaven. The spring spoke of spiritual nourishment, a nourishment offered by the nation of priests to Gentiles. See especially Isaac's ministry in Philistia, Genesis 26, verse 12 through 33. The patriarchs dug wells, built altars, and planted trees, Genesis 21, verse 33. And everything suggests that these were done together in grove settings. They were created open-air sanctuary gardens. They did not build a house for God. In our survey of the 11th step in the Exodus pattern above, we noted that in patriarchal times, after each Exodus, there was an altar built, while in subsequent eras, a house was built after each Exodus. The contrast is important. In the house, all the various materials are organized together. Labor, altar, wooden boards, trees. The house structure is an appropriate analog for a nation. The Hebrews were not an organized nation in the age of the patriarchs, however. Thus, neither a portable house tent nor a permanent temple would have been appropriate. Once the people progressed from glory to glory into a full-fledged nation, then the altar, tree spring garden, would progress into the glory of tabernacle and temple. The places Abraham made as his ministry headquarters were Shechem, Bethel, and Hebron, Genesis 12, verse 6 through 8, 13, verse 18. Jacob later made these the sites of his ministry also. These were the key sites initially captured by Joshua when he conquered Canaan. Thus, Abraham and Jacob were engaged in a shadow conquest of the land. More important, we see from this what true conquest is. The building of altars of evangelism preceded the cultural conquest. If we wish to build a Christian civilization in our land, we had best start with altars. The pillar also becomes an important patriarchal symbol, though only in one instance. When Jacob had his vision of the true tower of Babel, Babel equals gate of heaven, he awoke and took the stone that he had put at his head place 
and set it up as a pillar, and poured oil on its top, and he called the name of the place Bethel, house of God. However, formerly the name of the city had been Luz, Genesis 28, verse 18 through 19. This means that whenever we read of Bethel in Genesis, the people of that day called it Luz. Jacob stood outside the city and renamed it Bethel by faith, faith that someday Luz would indeed be a house of God. When Jacob came back into the land, he went again to Luz, and God again appeared to him. Then God went up from him in the place where he had spoken with him, and Jacob set up a pillar in the place where he had spoken with him, a pillar of stone, and he poured out a drink offering on it. He also poured oil on it, and once again named the place Bethel. Genesis 35, verse 13 through 15. God's ascension from the spot is clearly to be associated with the ladder to heaven. Thus, Jacob's stone pillars were symbols of God's holy mountain, the true ladder to heaven. In fact, Jacob explicitly called the pillar the house of God, and this stone which I have set up as a pillar will be God's house. Genesis 28, verse 22. Jacob poured out wine at the pillar, just as he would have poured it out at an altar. He poured oil over it, just as the Mosaic house of God, the tabernacle, would be permeated with oil. And just as God's human house, his priests, would have oil poured on him, Leviticus 8 verse 12. This oil represented God's cloud coming down on the mountain, filling the tabernacle, anointing him, his new Adam. The Bible pulls this imagery together in Psalm 133. Behold, how good and how pleasant it is for brothers to dwell together in unity. It is like the precious oil upon the head, coming down upon the beard, Aaron's beard, coming down upon the edge, mouth, the top of his robes. It is like the dew of Hermon, coming down upon the mountains of Zion. For there the Lord commanded the blessings, life forever. Thus the mist of God's cloud upon his mountain is parallel to the oil poured on Jacob's stone. It was a symbol that at the top of the holy mountain, the ladder to heaven, was the glory cloud of God. Jacob performed this ritual, which seems so strange to our simple, impoverished 20th century minds, in the sure and certain confidence that some day God's glorious cloud, his heavenly kingdom, would come to earth. The cloud and the oil represent the Holy Spirit, the bond of unity in the kingdom. The descent of the cloud on the mountain and of the oil on the pillar find their typological fulfillment with the descent of the Spirit on our Lord at his baptism and upon the church at Pentecost. History and Decline For a while, God's priestly nation was faithful to him. They prospered despite tribulation. They had successful ministries with the Philistines, who were anxious to be led and worshipped by Abraham and Isaac. As a climax, God converted the Pharaoh of Egypt and put Joseph in charge of the whole world. When Joseph married the daughter of the priest of Heliopolis, we see a unification between the older Noahic Gentile priesthood and the new Abrahamic special priesthood. During these years, the nation grew larger and larger, so that while only 70 from Jacob's immediate family went down into Egypt, Genesis 46, verse 27, yet the number of people in the nation was so great that they had to be given the entire land of Goshen, the best of the Edenic land, to dwell in, Genesis 47, verse 6, 13, verse 10. After a prosperous season in Egypt, however, the people lapsed into idolatry, Joshua 24, verse 14. God raised up a tyrant to scourge them, and thus put them into a crucible to restructure them. He tore apart the nation, reducing it to slavery, but only so that he could rebuild it again more glorious than before. Conclusion The patriarchal establishment was a relatively loose one. There was no national political organization, because the people existed under the government of other nations. Thus, in terms of analogical symbolism, there was no house or temple signifying them as God's people. Patriarchs dwelt in tents. It is a myth to think of them as nomads moving from place to place. Actually, the patriarchs lived in only a few places and for years at a time. Abraham lived at Hebron for about 25 years and at Beersheba and Gerar for about 75 years. If you live in a tent for such long periods of time, you obviously are not living in a teepee or a Bedouin tent. To get an idea of the patriarchal tent, we need look no further than the tabernacle. Such tents had wooden boards for walls, embedded in sockets and held up with metal rods. They had wooden pillars separating various rooms. 
They were covered with roofs of watertight leather. The only thing that made them tense was the fact that they had curtains along the walls, along with the boards, and the fact that they could, if necessary, be dismantled. Thus, the patriarchal tent was a semi-permanent affair. The patriarchs were not constantly on the move. This means that the sanctuary groves that they set up were not meager affairs. If you live in a place for 25 years, it stands to reason that you will make your place of worship into something nice. The patriarchal worship oasis was not a rude affair. Nevertheless, even though the imagery is very Adenic, there is an important difference between the patriarchal worship garden and the Garden of Eden. God planted the Garden of Eden. God set up the sanctuary. The patriarchal gardens were set up by men, though under divine guidance. Like Abraham's and Jacob's shadow conquests of the land, the sanctuary oasis were shadow gardens. Not until Moses would God give explicit directions and take steps to plant his own garden sanctuary in the earth. In summary, the patriarchal establishment had the following features. New names, God with God Almighty, the people, Hebrews, the grant, Canaan, which was anticipated, promise, your seed will possess it, stipulations, sacramental, circumcision, societal, God's charge, commandments, statutes, and laws, Genesis 26, verse 5, polity, patriarchal family heads and worship leaders, symbol, the Oasis Sanctuary. The Reconstructionist Radio Podcast Network brings to you a complete lineup of podcasts where you will hear practical and tactical theology. Our desire is not simply that you consume our shows, but that you also live out your faith in every area of life. We can talk all day long about these things, but if we fail to put them into practice, then we fail as ambassadors of Jesus Christ, our King. Subscribe now to your favorite Reconstructionist Radio Podcast Network shows. Or you can subscribe to the Reconstructionist Radio Master Feed, where all of the content we produce, including the audiobooks and audio articles, will pop up as soon as they are available. And don't forget to visit ReconstructionistRadio.com to volunteer as a narrator or to partner with this ministry financially. May the Holy Spirit stir you into action for Christ and His Kingdom.